Hello, hello and welcome to the breakdown. Well, from the comfort of our home to the comfort of your home. Yes, here in Auckland, we are at level three. We're in lockdown once again. And the team are really well and truly prepared, JK. I'm not sure where you're off to um, and where, where you're going, but um, how, are you, how are you coping with the, the, the latest challenges? Or obviously, you've got it under control. Now, all I wanted to say is that you can get fashionable masks. What I wanted to say was you can get fashionable masks, so wear them. Are they an order? Yeah. I actually, Adine, and she's actually sewn together some absolute beauties. It's a ripper. Yeah, we've got to wear them because I want to go. I don't care if I have to wear a mask, but I want to go back to live footy, all right? So put them on. Fair enough. How are you coping, Mills? Oh, I'm good. I mean, after the the initial reaction, I mean, I think this was this, this time last week when we first found out after the show that we were potentially going into level three. I think, um, yeah, well, we're back in it again. The, the hardest part is uh, when you're doing the show from home is the, the backdrop, right? <laughs> I've done it right this time around. Hey, I'm getting there, guys, so hopefully not 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 for too much longer. Of all of the team I was most concerned about is you, Bernie. You know, the fact that through lockdown, you were showing signs in the first lockdown that maybe it was starting to get to you, and now you're telling me you've just injured yourself running. Achilles is gone. What are you going to do? What are the odds? I'll just have to stay home for the next 10 days or so, won't I? It won't be a stretch. But your wife, she's mean on the Benina sewing machine. I'm going to put my order in for one of those masks. Clever girl you've got there at home, Jeff. Yeah. Um, hey, how good was Super Rugby Aotearoa? It doesn't seem like nine weeks ago, does it, that it all roared into life. It was absolutely unbelievable. Um, and we were treated to world-class footy. No one would deny that. Um, the Hurricanes and the Highlanders, they wrapped it all up under the roof where it all began. Well, that was a bit different, wasn't it? It was level two, no crowds. It was absolutely surreal, quite eerie. Crusaders, champions once again. We didn't get to see Razor Robertson doing his break dancing. We'll just have to live with that one. But the Crusaders did it with a game to spare, didn't they, lads? And that game was supposed to be the real final, JK, against the Blues. Now, the Blues have taken a hit at the gate takings, right? They reckon it's about a million dollars that they've lost out on without having those bods through the door. So what they are saying is that they will honour those tickets for anyone who doesn't want the refund, upgrade it to a Sapphire ticket, and they want a pre-match next season between the Crusaders and the Blues. So really, are you missing out or not? And, and a little added bonus to it is those people with those Sapphire tickets, 25% of that ticket money will go to junior rugby, to community initiatives back into the Blues region. So are you liking it, hating it, or rating it? Yeah, well, actually, I've got someone actually building a new trophy because the Crusaders wrecked theirs. So the last game was going to have a new trophy on it anyway. Uh, so that was the final game. So let's just play it pre-season next year. I love it. Family day. You know, I think um, it's difficult times and the Blues are trying to, you know, do some things differently. So, you know, 25% is going to go to, to charity and the rest is going to be used to you know, have great events. And so, yeah, bring it on if, if people feel that way inclined. The most important thing is that you can get your money back if you want. So that's that's important. It's, it's uh, the generosity of people, which I think during COVID we've seen a lot of. So, yeah, I'm all for it. You know, I, I think, you know, there's no doubt Auckland set the standard. Yes, you know, with 30-odd thousand, they averaged every uh, every home game this year and to get behind their, their, their Blues team. And, uh, you know, they've more often been questioned about their, their loyalties and their support behind their team. Now's a good chance to be able to show that support. And the, and the, the good thing about it is, is that that 25% will go to community rugby and to charity. Um, and there's always, you know, that option for you to get that refund. But, um, you know, I love the idea. I love that they're, look, they're looking forward, uh, looking ahead to next year as well. And, um, you know, hopefully they get the support from the public. Yeah, and after that competition, how, who would you deny them? It was just so, so brilliant. But like a few months ago, we've again been plunged into the unknown, haven't we? COVID has, has started to creep in yet again. And Auckland remains at elite level three until August the 26th. So um, what does that mean? It's restricted the opening of the Farah Palmer Cup. The opening two rounds have been put on ice. That, re that is being rescheduled. And also, what does this mean for the North-South game due to go in Auckland at Eden Park on the 29th of August? Will Eden Park get their game? It's not looking overly likely. That game only three days after the government will review the alert level. So the questions there, team, it's pretty much, will 
will the public be able to get to Eden Park? Will it host it? And if not, will another venue pick it up? And will there be a crowd? Will the players be able to relocate? NZR has said that the teams were supposed to gather in Auckland on Monday, assembling there. That will now be Wellington. But they also have to go through the exemption process like everybody else. So they are in a holding pattern, but it's looking more and more likely that Wellington will be the venue, that everything is going to move to the capital. That decision will be made on Friday once the government will reassess the alert level. So it will be a lot clearer there. And if it does, anyone with a ticket to Eden Park, to that Auckland North-South game on the 29th, will get a refund. How many blows can Eden Park take? Yeah, no, that's a tough one. I mean, it's just out of our control. And I think the whole thing about COVID that you've got to start thinking about is this just stuff that you can't control and stuff that you can control. So, you know, I just hope the game goes ahead. I'm a bit like, you know, what Goldie sort of talks about is that even without, you know, crowd on the weekend, it was an outstanding game, the Highlanders hurricane. So I think it's just going to be a great contest, whatever it brings. Let's hope we can all um, file into Eden Park and I'm going to be hopeful, but if not, as long as they play, I reckon. Yeah, well, I've named those sides. I've picked those teams. You know, they've got them out there now. The coaches want to get their hands on the mills. That's the reality, right? The coaches want to get their hands on the players. These are the all-black coaches that have been put together. They're already supposed to have played three test matches this year. They're looking forward to, to getting an opportunity to work with them. And we're all looking forward to this contest. And I, I'm, I watched that game, that Hurricanes and Highlanders game down in Dunedin. And for me, it still had the tension. It still had the competitiveness about it. And if we can't get the crowds, I still think we'll get the spectacle and something to enjoy on television. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Goldie. And I think it's it's not a three-test series, right? So in terms of the preparation, it won't be dist disturbed too much. Yeah, the coaches will want to get their hands on them and sort of try and implement, uh, you know, some sort of game plan. But in, in terms of coming together and trying to nail that, I, I don't think we'll be too worried about that. I think, you know, guys, there'll be guys on, on, uh, on both sides that would have played with, the, with each other in, in, in other games, but coming together and really, you know, getting that spectacle, I'm not worried too much about that. So um, I'm not worried about the preparation time um, towards that game. I just hope it happens and uh, that we can get confirmation on that once we hit, um, you know, come out of level three. Bernie, we're still concerned, aren't we, that Mills hasn't decided who he's supporting, right? <laughs> oh, I made that very clear last week. I made that very clear last week who I was supporting. I don't see you beating your chest or anything like that. I mean, you're you're well and truly north, Burn. Is that the way it works? One hundred percent, absolutely. None of this flip flopping business. One hundred percent north all the way. As we go through some of the challenges and the uncertainty of the professional game, well, if you go inside New Zealand rugby, the head of that professional arm is Chris Lindrum. And Lindo, thanks so much for coming on the show. We know you guys are in significant discussions on so many different levels right now, but I'm going to ask you this. The team of people, who, who is it that is guiding us through this or making these key decisions about what's happening in the future around MITRE 10 Cup, the rugby championship? Who are the individuals, the guys that you have to work closely with to make those key decisions? Yeah, Eden and Goldie and, and team. Um, at our end, obviously, there's a, there's a group of really um, experienced senior administrators and we work closely with our board um, and all of our partners in super rugby clubs and, and provincial unions. But if you're looking for names, um, there's a couple of key people who've, who've really done the hard yards uh, in terms of getting up Investec Super Rugby Aotearoa over the last 10 weeks. Uh, Cameron Good, who's the head of our tournaments and competitions team, uh, has worked really closely with his team um, and all of those stakeholders I mentioned. Um, and obviously the medical staff um, have been critical in, in, in getting, getting that up as well. And so all of those people um, are, uh, are still working really hard at the moment as we, as we pick through how we approach the next few weeks. What do you actually do moving forward? Because the, the problem that we have and the public has is we don't know what the hell's going on. So do you go, you know, it's rugby, Aotearoa for next year as our prime concern and then maybe with the Aussies in, I mean do you have three or four systems that you're looking at at the moment? Yeah contingencies is sort of the word of the moment um, JK and even just over the last week you know so much has changed we were cruising along as a country um, pretty happily through this global crisis and here we are um, you're all sitting at home in level three I'm sitting at home in level two. Um, our teams in the Auckland area can't train. Uh, we've had to call a game off, you know. So you, 
you're constantly revisiting what you can do um, and, and how to approach situations. In terms of next year, what have we learned? Well, we've learned we've got a really viable five-team uh, competition if that's what we need to do next year. We've just come off the back of an absolutely outstanding 10-week competition, slightly disappointing end. I know, JK, you would have loved the opportunity to uh, see the Blues stick one up the Crusaders over the weekend, and we've all missed out um, on what would have been an absolute blockbuster. Um, but we know that competition, it has generated so much good rugby, is, is viable, you know. Um, it's not our preference. We would ideally like to play um, a broader trans-Tasman uh, competition, but we just don't know whether we're going to have the ability to do that. So... At New Zealand Rugby, uh, what we're having to try to do is carry both of those things, um, you know, at the same time, try and plan on a number of fronts, um, and then hopefully time will, um, will will provide us with a bit more certainty as to what option we take. Well, Chris, it's hard enough that you've got all that on your plate in terms of Super Rugby Old Town, all, but our biggest brand, obviously, the All Blacks, you know, and obviously, you know, overseas, you know, the Europeans have sort of started their competition. Have you started discussions about what test match rugby could look like for, for the All Black brand? Yeah, we certainly have. We're obviously really focused on this year. Um, I think we've been pretty open uh, in our desire to get uh, the Wallabies and the All Blacks playing um, during the course of, of this year. Um, three to four tests, uh, potentially, maybe some in Australia, maybe some here or maybe all here. And then there's the work that's going in um, uh, into the Investec Rugby Championship and I think everyone knows that Sansar have invited New Zealand Rugby to host that tournament here. We're obviously the, the country that amongst those four partners that to date has fared the best through the, the COVID pandemic. And so we're working with government at the moment um, to, to try to see whether it's possible to host those three teams in, under what conditions they need to come in, um, how they might have to quarantine or isolate um, before they can train as a group and then as a team. Um, and then obviously have to talk to the teams themselves and the players about whether they're happy with all of those conditions that will be around it. So there's a huge amount to work through, but we remain really positive sitting here today that we could still have eight, nine All Blacks matches in, in uh, 2020. How far down the track are you with those discussions? We're working really closely with government. Um, obviously, uh, things are things are busy. You can imagine if you if you work at the Ministry of Health that rugby is not your only priority at the moment. We just have to uh, take our take our place in the queue. But they've been fantastic um, to work with uh, all the way through this um, this this period. And uh, so we're we're hoping that in the next couple of weeks we'll get some nice clear guidance from them and be able to pick things up with our with our SANS, our colleagues and, and go from there. I can ask you this, the fact there's a lot of pressure financially on New Zealand rugby. We're well and truly aware of that because of, of the, the revenue that has been lost through the course of this year. This is also a season, a year of uh, the collective bargaining with the Rugby Players Association here in New Zealand. These are critical discussions. How confident are that you, the, all of the parties that are coming together are really clear on the challenges you are facing and will be prepared to make maybe some sacrifices over the next little wee while to make sure the longevity of the union? Yeah, I'm really confident, Goldie. I think um, what we've seen this year is in crisis, it's brought everybody together and barriers that used to exist between different parties in the, the sort of rugby community, uh, at least on the professional side, have come down and everyone's been prepared to work together to uh, get a competition up and running, to um, create more content for our commercial partners uh, to do things that we haven't done before, um, you know, even innovations to rules during this last competition uh, just happened so easily and with so much buy-in from everybody. So, look, we the other thing you do a lot in these in these crisis times is you talk a lot. You spend a lot of time on Zooms like this, talking to your colleagues um, out in provincial unions and Super Rugby clubs and Rugby Players Association and so on. And and everybody gets it, you know. Um, we're, we're really lucky in New Zealand that we're small enough to still have all of those conversations as sensibly as we do. Um, there's a lot of big issues to pick through. You're, you're 100% right in saying that. But um, I'm, I'm really confident in the calibre of people we've got in rugby that we can get there. So I'm, I am pro a Pacific Island team, but I'm 
I'm against it being in New Zealand. So where is that sitting at the moment? Because you've got no time left. There needs to be some decisions on that, right? Yeah, there is. Yeah, we're middle of August now and, and any new team that was going to play uh, in a competition next year is really going to have to be stood up no later than the, the start of January, JK, as, as you'd well know, if not earlier, you know, um, and planning needs to start now. So we're, we're working through a process quickly around that in the next three to four weeks um, and uh, we'll probably have more information on that for you in due course. Are you optimistic of the fact that they talk about sustainability is that 2021 in itself, it, it still can be a really positive year, but it may not necessarily be the direction that the game is going in the long term? Uh, I think in terms of our planning, um, guys, we're, we're really motivated to make sure that 2021 is a stepping stone to whatever comes beyond in, in 22, right? So you, you can't... Um, you can't just create a team, for example, wish a team up and then wish it away a year later because it doesn't work or it's not consistent with what you're going. It's not fair to the people involved. It's not fair to our fans or anybody. Um, so there's certainly we're on a bit of a journey and, and COVID is going to um, restrict that journey potentially in 21 and, and keep our sights uh, shorter than we might otherwise like it. Um, but that's the hand that we're all being dealt with at the world at the moment. And it's not just rugby that's suffering from that. So, um, I know, again, I remain really confident um, in, in our ability to, to progress positively. I know it's a challenge, Lindo. Look, we appreciate you coming on, giving us the insight that you could give us, uh, particularly looking forward. We know there's some big decisions and big negotiations you've got going on, but we're hopeful of Test Match Rugby. We know you guys are trying to put on as much as you possibly can. And, I look forward to catching up with you once again, maybe when some more of these key decisions have been made. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, And thanks, Mills and JK. Keep those ideas coming, right? We need all of them at this time. Stay with us. After the break, we talk to All Black head coach Ian Foster, as well as Patrick Tupolotu, about the upcoming North and South game. Don't go away. Welcome back to the breakdown. We're early on today. Yes, of course, the North and South game. The teams are out there. The squads have been put together. They are going to assemble in Wellington next week as sides. And then later on, we'll find out whether this game's going to be at Eden Park or whether it's Sky Stadium. He's finally got a chance to see his players. Ian Foster, the All Black coach. Fozzie, welcome to the breakdown. Okay, are you like a kid in a candy store now? You're not coaching sides. You get to see these guys do battle. What are your expectations, whether it's in Wellington or Eden Park? Yeah, look, uh, good evening, guys. It's, it's, oh, it's fantastic to be at this point. You know, it's, um, you know, I've been a, a watching Super Rugby Aotearoa closely. They've been exciting competition, and I reckon the, you know, all the all five of the clubs have done an amazing job in that space. So, big congrats to them. And it, it's a, this North South a great opportunity, you know, to to reward a lot of people from that competition who's put their hand up and and to be involved in what you know what I hope will be a, a real special occasion you know part of our history a one-off type game and and a chance for people to play you know mix and match the teams a little bit and, and to have a and to play for something that's been part of our rugby thing for a long time so from an all-black side we're very excited Fozzie, I mean, as you, as you mentioned Aotearoa, Super Rugby Aotearoa has been impressive and there was always sort of talk around you know, guys that are sort of not going to be around, particularly around your, your locking department. I want to sort of just ask you, you know, around the locks, what gets, gets the, the nod, um, you know, ahead of this sort of game for guys like Salby Rickett and um, and, and also, uh, who was it, uh, Tupo Bai, ahead of Putty Putty Parkinson and, and Kelly Toyoti? Yeah, look, there's, you know, always when, you, when you're selecting a team, there's, um, there's two things. There's always unlucky people and there's always some, some late changes. So I think when you look at the late change category, uh, you know, both, you know, we lost two locks in the last game, which was Quinton Strange and Putty Putty have been been ruled out of contention with um, uh, a sternum injury and, and an ankle injury in Putty Putty's case. So that took them out of the frame. So we've had to, you know, have a look at how we select our locks. So, um, and, and we'll know more about their injury status in, in the next few days long term. Um, when it comes to, to the rest, I mean, there's, 
two locks that were pretty easy to pick, weren't they? You know, with Patrick and and with um, and with Sam playing outstanding. Tupo Vey, we, we really watched him in the under twenties last year. He was a reasonably dominant figure in there. Um, he knows the game well. He's vocal. We know he's young, but we really believe this is a great game to chuck someone like, like him in and just expose him to to some different people playing next to. You know, they like the opportunity to play next to Paddy it will be exciting for him and, and to watch how he prepares. And so it's just a chance to see where he's at and where he's at in his development. Um, Manaki Salvi Rickett was someone that we, we like with his athleticism. He's he's a big man. He bounces around. He, he's still, you know, I think that he's still got a lot to learn, but that, that's okay. And it's just a matter of put him in a different environment around some different people and let's just see where he goes. So it's an exciting time for the locks. What about the starting size? Have those been selected? Have you guys got a, a clear idea in your mind who the starting 15s are going to be going in? Yeah, well, I've got them on the screen in front of me, but you can't. You want me to turn the screen around? You can have a look at it. So it's <laughs> uh, the uh, you know we've look we've we, yes we have we we've got a clear idea of what we want to do. We, we don't want to name that yet because we just want the teams to assemble. And as we know, there's a whole lot of uncertainty around about assembly and, and where people are coming from and, and days and stuff so we, we're just we're going to leave the, our our options open there but we, we've got a pretty clear plan about how we want to work this game and um you know because if you look at it from an all-black view you know to be fair it was you know we've we, we've certainly got a, a 35 penciled in from an all-black view and in some ways that was a slightly easier um conversation than picking these two teams and so it's really just a, a matter of, of looking at the combinations, looking at giving some people an opportunity to, to really impress and, and to see particularly what some of the younger players are, are going to be like when they get on a stage in a, in a slightly different environment that's outside their current comfort zone. So they are the sort of questions that we're looking hard at. Fozzie, well, one guy that clearly sticks out in the north, you've only picked one first five. And that's Bowden and Barrett. And unless you've got this, it's a smoke screen and you're thinking someone else is going to come in. Does this really affirm the fact that he's going to be a 10? Look, I've always said he's a 10 who can play 15. And, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, I guess it's going to be talked about a lot, isn't it? You know, the Richie versus Bodie and where's the best position for Bodie. We, we, we love him at 10. We love him at 15. Um, thought he played well for us last year at 15. We had a game plan that he touched the ball a lot in that position and almost basically the same amount that Richie did. So, you know, we've still got that option clear. But really, this is a great game, you know, for him to play 10 and to get more time in that position. And it's not a, it's not a position that, ironically, we've got a lot of depth in in this country. And so we're desperate for both these two to play really, really well in this position. We've got no doubt that should the international season go the way it's going to go, is that they're both going to end up playing 10 at some point. So um, so for us, it's a big game. It was disappointing for him that, he, that you know, the Blues Crusaders game got called off because that would have been another big game for him to play there. So we feel this is a, a bit of a must. So I guess we're sort of giving you our indication of selection. But when you look at the backups, we've got, we've got Damien who can cover 10 during a game and... And obviously, um, we've, we've selected Mitch Hunt as that sort of 10, 15 cover as well to give us another option. Is this game going to lead to you announcing that first All Black squad? Yeah, yeah, we're still intending to name it the next day on, on the 30th. Um, you know, I know that, uh, you know, we're going through a, a sort of a second wave scenario here in Auckland with COVID and it's changed a whole lot of things and, and it could still change the next two weeks. We know that. But, our, you know, at the moment, we're still planning on a pretty significant program, you know, late October, November, maybe into early December, because that's what we have to plan on. And um, so it's this chance to play this game, to to name an All Black squad and, and to have five days together before they go back to their minor 10 cup and play in round one, I think will be great for us. And it means we can get some work done so that whatever happens later in the year, at least we've got some uh, big rocks in place for us. For you sitting there now and having named this, and you look at the depth, the guys like Alex Fido, you know, Bosch here, the Scrafton's right through to the back line. Um, some young guys there of class. Uh, and I mean, how pleasing is that, you know, after a year after a Rugby World Cup for a coach to come in and say, man, 
our depth in New Zealand rugby is, is pretty impressive. Yeah, look, it's exciting, you know, and and we have sat here and looked at it and thought, wow, this is pretty cool because we've got some existing All Blacks who are playing really well. We've got some new up and coming talent that we've been given a chance to to highlight in a different environment, and we we can't wait for that. But you know, the other thing, Mills, is that it's been a chance to reward some players who've been around a while too that have really put their hand up. We, we think this year, and I think this North South has been a great opportunity to, to reward them. And, and I'll put the likes of a like an Ash Dixon in that in that category, you know, who's been an absolute warrior for the Highlanders and hasn't really had an opportunity with us at an All Black level. He has played a lot of pride with the Māori All Blacks, but a chance for him to be selected, you know, and, and he's alongside Kirk Eklund, who's, who's been another success story the last month. So there's been some really... Uh, good stories in this, and hopefully it creates an experience that they'll, they'll remember for a long time. Thanks, mate. As always, making your time to come on the breakdown, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on the sidelines, I'm sure, at the North-South game. Thanks, mate. Pleasure, gents. Well, Patrick Tuipalotu joins us here on the breakdown once again. Thanks very much, Patty. I know you've had a couple of weeks on the sideline. You didn't get the game you were looking for at Eden Park against the Crusaders on Sunday, but Today, you've been named in the north side to take on the south. There's plenty of crusaders in that outfit, in my outfit, to be fair. So how much are you looking forward to getting back on the park and taking on a few of those crusaders boys in a south jersey? Yeah, pretty excited. Uh, it's almost been three weeks without any rugby. We've had a bye week and uh, almost obviously missed that crusaders game. So no game there and going to a week off. Well, not really a week off now. Uh, got to keep the legs ticking over. Um, no rugby, so that means we've got to fit that in somewhere. And um, yeah, definitely looking forward to the spectacle of, of North, what the North South brings. Is that part of the? Is that part of the kit? The hair, the new hair, Patty. I'm <laughs> loving, loving the pink, brother. How good's that? That is. Um, well, the last lockdown I died it, and then had to go and look into lockdown again. So got bored for a day or two. Just you did realize, Patty, that last week he, he was talking about G-strings and, and the North <laughs> Auckland rugby and all sorts, mate. He went off the reservation. That's what JK did. I mean, you guys, I mean, when you talk about motivation, you talk about this competition, most of you, all of you probably haven't played in this sort of a contest. How much of an edge, given the fact that they're talking possible all-black trial, really, the quality of the two teams, what sort of game are you expecting? A pretty tough encounter. I, I mean... If you put an All Blacks trial in there, it's uh, everyone's trying to put their hand up. Everyone's trying to make a statement, and I think that's what this this will be. Uh, there'll be an element of uh, home homegrown roots and trying to represent where you're from, as well as trying to put a hand up for higher honours. Paddy, I, I want to sort of go back, I suppose, to um, you know the season that you've had, and you've had an incredible season. I know you're disappointed the fact that uh, you didn't get to play that last game against the Crusaders, but one of the things that really stood out was the fact that you embraced your, your Samoan heritage. And it was something that was sort of everyone caught on to. You know, TJ Perenara came out as well and started, you know, speaking that um, when, he, when he came on to the to his, his, uh, post-game interviews. What what prompted that for you to really embrace that? Oh, well, I'm not very fluent in my Samoan. And we did some Samoan classes. I started them as a group in, in the Blues PD sessions. And uh, one of the things we learned was how to greet people and... Um, obviously how to do an aftermatch speech. So I thought, well, we're back playing now, uh, especially in, in, the, in our hometowns. It's big for us where there's a lot of Pacific Islanders representing uh, New Zealand. And uh, I thought, well, why not? I'll, I'll give it a go. And then from then on, it, it sort of caught on. And the, the most pleasing thing for me was to see TJ do that as well um, the next game. And then... I caught up with him after our know, Hurricanes, last Hurricanes game, and he actually told me that he didn't feel comfortable because he wasn't fluent. So he was in the same position as me. And um, for me to thought it's a non-fluent speaking Samoan, it sort of spurred him on to do the same thing as, as a non-fluent uh, speaking Māori. So it's, it's a pretty cool thing to be able to represent our culture and do it on the stage that we're on. So um, very proud moment for me. And I'm, I suppose a proud moment for a lot of people in New Zealand and around the world. Thanks, uh, Paddy. It takes a whole lot of courage because I've been in that situation and you're so scared about making mistakes. But it sort of leads to 
one thing that we've no, noticed from the sidelines is just that incredible growth in you as a as a leader and as a person. So, you know, as you're moving forward, I know you've re-signed with the NZRFU, which is fantastic. You know, do you continue that growth once you get at higher levels? What What are you thinking about? Have, have you got that personal confidence in yourself to say, well, actually, I also want to take a step forward in the All Blacks and, 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 and lead there as well? Yeah, for me, it's just coming out of my shell, I think. Um, I remember when you signed me back in 2014, I was just a little shy kid who uh, was just happy to be there. And I think the growth for me is I'm a, in a leadership role now where I need to motivate and get a big group of guys to work towards a common goal. And um, it's a good start, I would say. But for myself, keep being myself, but I think I've got to keep pushing the boundaries and uh, see where... Um, see what I can fit into that stretch zone where I'm trying to grow more and then add, add more to my game and, as well as off the field. There's so, there's so many things, so many hurdles up in Auckland. You, you talk about the culture and what you had to sort of try and create, but even things like, you know, uh, three different PUs and coming from one side of Auckland to the other. What did you have to really focus on to, to make sure that was successful off the field? Yeah, it was... It was really just coming together and focusing on what the Blues wanted. So there's a lot of talk in the past years that it, it's too hard for boys to get together because Auckland's so big and then you've got Northland, North Harbour, and then you've got other guys coming from different regions. We pretty much just sat down and said, well, that doesn't matter. If we're going to be here for the Blues, there's going to be no excuses. So the pleasing thing about that is everyone jumped on board and, uh, and backed it 100%. And, like you can tell the team environment now, everyone wants to play for each other. Um, that's a given. And I think, again, that's pleasing because the way you see us train as well as play and um, sort of have the backing of our supporters, it's a pretty strong um, motivator for a lot of this group. And I think that's where we'll find a lot of success. One of the guys... Paddy, that's really impressed me because just because of his personality, he's, he's, he attracts a lot of attention. And that's Akira Ioane. He's just worked so hard. I, I believe he's one of the most improved, you know. Like, if you think about the criticisms he got last year, not getting his shoulder on, not doing the hard work, you know, and he's actually probably been the most improved in those areas that he was asked to that I've ever seen, you know, when people say, I want you to do this, and he's gone and done it. Amazing turnaround. Yeah, you look at someone like him, he, over his first years in his career, ball in hand has been damaging, and that's what he's been known for, but turn it around, and this year, he hasn't had the ball in hand as much as he would like to, but he's still making a lot of damage in the tackle area, he's being a menace, he's getting around the park more, and he's just a lot more fitter, and he's a lot more, how would you say, alive and in the game, and uh, for someone like that, he's obviously been through, through the trenches with uh, a lot of a lot of feedback and what the public are saying about him, but he's done very well to, to back himself and keep his keep his head to the ground and keep working hard because um, obviously I'm close with him. I hang out a lot with him and uh, it's just been pleasing to see that he's managed to get through a lot of that hardship and come out the other side and play well. Lastly, Paddy, you've had a couple of weeks of recovery time and of course you've been training through it. You talked about the desire to get back out there. If you had to go through Super Rugby Aotearoa one more time, just in a holding pattern, how much would you look forward to it coming in fresh next year? If that's what the option is, is that something you want to have another crack at? Definitely. I'd relish the chance to, to have another Super Rugby Aotearoa. Um, it's fast, fun rugby. Uh, I remember the first three weeks of the competition, I was, uh, I was heading into the Highlanders game real sore. And then to be able to get to the, or to the ninth week and be better than, or be feeling better than I did then. It's uh, it's pretty amazing. So if we had it again, I'd uh, jump at a chance. I know a lot of people would enjoy the rugby in terms of our fans and especially the players. So it would be fun. We've loved it, mate. We've loved your action. But I tell you what, you've got another challenge in front of you. I'm giving the South the big pep talk here, buddy. They're coming <laughs> here. Got... Mills hasn't decided which side of the pep. <laughs> no, but I tell you what, that'll be it. This is as good as it gets. You get yourself ready because we're coming for you. I'll be ready. I'll be ready. All right. You get ready. Thanks, Paddy. Cheers. Thank you. Great to get some insights into the big game coming up here in a couple of weeks. But after the break, stay with us. It's time for us to give out a few awards here on The Breakdown. 
We're going to look at back. at Super Rugby Aotearoa. Pick our most valuable player. Who's evolved the best and our breakthrough out of what has been a fantastic season. See you after the break. Too much people talking, I'm just going to be me. Super Rugby Aotearoa finished up at the weekend. Not the finish we were hoping for in Auckland. It was down under the roof in Dunedin where the Highlanders got up over the Hurricanes. But time now for us to look back across the course of this fantastic tournament, the amount of competition, the talent was on show. So, of course, you've got to have some sort of awards. What we're going to do, we're going to look at the big three, the big three from the tournament tonight. But next week, we'll have a bit of fun. We'll find some obscure randoms, which JK and Nils They've already come up with a couple of great ones to us to look at, but we're going to look at the key ones, the core ones. And I'll tell you what, the evolution of a player, and that's the first one. Okay, we've got three players, three nominees, and I look at those, Rico Iwani, Akira Iwani, and Geordie Barrett. And what am I saying? It's the evolution of their game. And for those three players, gents, they all stood up in different ways. Which one for you evolved, actually became that complete player that we're always looking for? Well, for me, it's easy because I think that um, Geordie, the interesting question that we need to ask about Geordie was, has he always been that good, but he's been under the shadow of his brother down there. But when he came back from injury this year, Mills, you'll agree, he was absolutely outstanding, right? And the difference and the confidence that he brought to the Hurricanes was palatable, right? We all felt that. Akira, you know, uh, uh, sorry, Rico, I've always thought he's been that good. So... Um, and I thought he was outstanding at centre, ran great angles and was looking for a support. But for me, his brother is the transformation because here's a guy, like I mentioned before to Paddy, who has been getting a hammering from the public. You know, publicly, Hanson came out last year and said, get your shoulder on, son. You know, hit those rucks. And he's done that. He's got himself fit. He's hit some rucks. You know, he's carrying the ball less. So for me, boys, it goes to Akira. Mills? Yeah, well, yeah, I think you're definitely right. You hit the nail on the head in terms of those three players. Different aspects. You look at Geordie and the way he's come back. I, man, he's always been a great player. He's just sort of starting to find his feet. I still think that his probably preferred, preferred position, or probably my preferred position for him would be in the midfield. But, gee, he, was, he, he impacted uh, so much in a positive way when he came back for the Hurricanes. Rico, so much uncertainty in terms of, you know, shifting, you know, off the wing. He was world class. Yes, he had a little bit of a lull last, last year in the World World Cup and didn't quite get his, um, his position. And then all of a sudden, there were some doubts whether he could actually play centre. Well, he showed, you know, those sort of aspects that you needed, the skill set needed, um, you know, to play that centre position. So he was outstanding. But you, you look at that and, you know, I'd have to agree with you in terms of, you know, Akira, you know, a guy that uh, had Hoskins, he was out of, um, you know, that first part of Super Rugby in terms of he wasn't sort of being picked. He's come back, he's changed his game. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, he's, he's, he's sort of blossomed. Um, now, I, lo I love that about a player, the fact that you can go through all that adversity. You've got to get yourself back, um, back into sort of that sort of mode. He sort of showed a bit of vulnerability as well. So really, I think I'd have to agree, agree with you there, JK. Akira, for me, you know, gets that award. Just because you moved from fullback to the midfield means everybody else should. We've made that mistake in the past. Jordy Barrett is a fullback. He's world class. He's effective with everything he's done. He's done there. I have no doubts that he is the guy that should get an opportunity to play in that flex using the 15 
due to the way the confidence he is playing. But I agree entirely. agrego has been great, but Akira Ioane for me, a guy that I've been, I, I would admit, I've been frustrated with in the past um, uh, because of, I see the natural ability that he's always had, the athletic ability, but all of a sudden he has become a player who impacts the game completely differently to the way he impacted the game previously. The fact that his work rate, his tackle percentages and involvement, he's just found different ways. They gave him that opportunity by doing it at six for the Blues and a lot of credit has to go to that coaching staff and to that group to get that guy back from where he was at minus 10 cut last year. He wasn't the same player. That is a transformation. That is an amazing, amazing performance. The other one, one of the other key ones is, is breakout. Uh, guys who in their first season, or not their first season, but all of a sudden, they have arrived. And our nominees, Hoskins Satutu, Marino Makaeli Tu'u, and the other one, Will Jordan at fullback for the Crusaders. I'm going to go to you first, Mills. If here's three guys that have had fantastic campaigns who, for you, all of a sudden, had their biggest impactful season. Well, I'll tell you what, another guy that's been through a lot of adversity in terms of injuries as well is Will Jordan. Well, he's set this uh, tournament in the light in terms of what he could do and, um, you know, the try scoring machine he became, you know, outside a very sort of well-oiled machine in terms of the Crusaders. So, you know, wonderful season. It's great to see him come back through that sort of injury. Mikael Etuul, well, um, you'd have to say an emerging player and, and he really had to roll the sleeves up in terms of, uh, you know, where he was at and with the Highlanders uh, and things like that. But, you know, I, I suppose Hoskins, you know, another Blues, JK will be ha happy with this. For me, really, when you look at someone that's sort of, you know, um, first real year breakout player um, and done all the right things week in, week out, and this is before Super Rugby Aotearoa as well, he just transformed into a, a, a different sort of a different sort of a beast. And, and, you know, what you've seen out of him, particularly off the back of the scrum, you hadn't sort of got that in the, in the years with the Blue State. And I think he was really significant in terms of the way they played this year. So, you for me, it'd have to be yeah, Hoskins to Tutu. Mikaeli Tu, I think, has been outstanding and in a different sort of way to Hoskins uh, Mills. You know, I've really liked just his hard work. He's bruising. He likes to get his shoulder on. He smacks people. He's got a decent um, size to him. Um, you know, I think that for me, Will Jordan is a real class act. He is what I would call a classic Cantabrian, well formed, doesn't like make a lot of mistakes. He's got a little bit of X factor. Does his job well, um, but I'm 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 sort of thinking Hoskins just for they're probably all the same, but Hoskins has for his age showed incredible maturity. I remember one scrum, um, and the Blues were in their 22, and I don't think they got the hit on. They're going back and forth. he picked it up and he took it outside the 22 with a, with a run, so he showed incredible maturity. And I can remember sitting there with you, Goldie, saying. Oh, they need to rest them. You know, he's a young fella. They need to protect them. He just got better and better and better. So, you know, I think that um, to go into that level and then go, actually, I'm going to nail this and play with a with a, a composure of someone who's older. So, you know, I think all three of them are outstanding. I think all three of them hopefully will be in the All Black frame just because they are the future. But yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think Hoskins has been, um, you know, the only thing to take away from him probably he didn't finish the season. But, yeah. you know. And that's to me, I think that's where I come from, JK, in terms of the sample size, in terms of the fact that had he gone through the full campaign and had the same impact, in saying that, it was on, on the back of what has been an improved, a vastly improved combination of players in front of him. In terms of that forward pack, every single week delivering, I think it allowed him to go out and show those skills. Uh, I look at guys, uh, in, in this case, the fact that the impact that they're having on the game, this was different to me. Uh, he just, he just to me, they needed someone like a Nasi Manu. That was the standard they had there at number eight for the Hollanders. And Mikaeli too, who has done that for them. And on every week, he, he did that. He carried strongly. He was involved in the game. He worked, played massive minutes. I'm really impressed with the, the way that he's gone. But for me, I, I'm actually going to go Will Jordan. You know, sometimes there are guys who are, I think, a little bit special. And this kid has fought through those injuries that uh, you talked about, Mills. And he has got the ability to be right place, right time, and he's always there and has an impact on the game and his gas. You can't you can't get away from the fact that his ability to finish and score tries and he played with a physicality I hadn't seen before. He actually brought that to his game. So 
to me, I, I, he's my breakout player. I think he's the guy that... It's irrelevant, it. mate. You lost 2-1. It's irrelevant. You lost 2-1. Oh, no, it doesn't mean that I'm wrong. It doesn't matter what you think. It's 2-1. Take your blues head off. Take your blues head off. Let's see how you go at MVP of the tournament then. Because this is a hard one to argue across. Because you talk about guys who have stood up and led their teams and played with great passion. We spoke to one of them in Patrick Tui Palotu because he had, has led the Blues. He's one of our nominees. Aaron Smith for the Highlanders. You think about most valuable player. Where would they have been without him? If he wasn't playing, would they have been as competitive and won games like they did? And then, of course... Look, Richie Moonga, world class, outstanding with the champion side, Mills. I'm coming to this going, you know what? I think this is really hard to separate them, but the world class performances of Richie Moonga, big moments, he has had the ability to go out there and perform. And only just on one occasion I can remember not quite getting a conversion against the Hurricanes, which would have tied the game, but everything beyond that was spectacular. He was just that little bit better than the other two across the course of a great competition. Gee, I mean, how exciting when you, you bring up those three names and you think, man, that's leadership right right across there, isn't it? It's all over those three names in terms of where the All Blacks uh, will be at. Um, you know, Aaron Smith is probably a little bit reluctant in terms of uh, wanting to take on a bit more lead, uh, leadership role, but I, I think more around the decision-making. You know, he was really focused on doing his own job and doing that correctly. Once he got the knack of the decisions around the field, gee, he was um, he was electric, and it almost this competition brought something and um, something different out of him. It sort of enlightened and refreshed him. So, and and he definitely performed um, with Paddy leadership. You know, he's, we've always sort of talked about guys that sort of thrive on that leadership. He's come out, he's he's vulnerable in terms of his post-match sort of speeches and what he's spoken about, and that's really sort of lifted a, a, a franchise. You know, um, um, considering where they've been, so huge sort of leadership skills there. But for me, really, you know, Richie Moonga, man, what a season he's had. And, and not because, um, you know, he was, he was behind a pack that was, you know, constantly going forward. But for the big moments, you know, they, this wasn't a Crusaders team that sort of got their way all the time. You know, they're under the pump. They're, they're behind on the scoreboard. And who do they turn to? Um, you know, for, for, for um, a guy that's just sparked something from nothing, you know, under the pump. And that's why, for me, you know, Richie Morgan, in terms of his skill set, but also, you know, you've got to think of that, that game against the Blues. Under the pump, the Blues had just scored. What does he do? That kick to the 10 metre. But it doesn't just sort of kick to the 10 metre. He regains it, gets it back. And all of a sudden, the momentum of the game just totally changes, you know, to, to the pass that he sort of threw as well that ended up they ended up scoring. That's a guy that changes moments. And for me, really, Richie Moonga, he deserves the MVP. I, I, I can't go past Richie Moonga because... X factor at the right moment, at the right time. And when you, you're playing with one of those guys, you just go, man, how did he do that? And the thing I liked about him the most is that it was as if he'd made a mental decision. I'm going to take this game by the scruff of the neck and I'm not going to lose today. And I just think it's just a little bit intriguing for all of us about, you know, we've got Barrett, we've got Moanga. You know, what are we going to do? I mean, what a great problem to have, Goldie. Well, exactly that. And one of those things I love about what you're talking about is, is we've still got competition as well. There are players that we could have in this conversation. We spoke to Cody Taylor last week about playing this competition again. We've just spoken to Patrick Tuipulotu. That's what Super Rugby Aotearoa brought out on people, I believe, the best of the players. Like, it challenged them every single week. Now, how much better off are we going to be uh, when we start thinking about collectively all of these players having gone through this challenge, every single one of the mills now know that this is the standard that you are expected to perform on. If you're Ian Foster and you've selected North-South teams, which they've done, you've put those two groups together, you've got an all-black trial, you look at these names and you're going, but well, you now pick a squad, you know, that has had this level of competition. I want that going forward. That's why I want to see it at least for one more year. Let's bring Byrne back in. We've picked our MVP, Richie Mawanga, for us, was the star of the show. A lot of competition, though, Byrne. You watched all of it. You were there. You were presenting front and centre for you. Was it him as well, or did you have someone else in mind? Oh, Richie Mawanga just dominated all the stats. He started every game. He was in sensational form, and you've got to say he's the form number 10 at the moment. Exciting times ahead for the ABs, don't you reckon? He was a part of so many of our two degrees game-changing moments. And our mates at Two Degrees want to give you one last chance 
again to win some amazing prizes. Last week's winner was Carol Ashton. Congrats, Carol. Keep an eye out for the courier. Might be a couple of days longer, given the circumstances, but some goodies on their way to you. Um, you could win a Samsung S20 phone, a year of mobile and broadband data, courtesy two degrees, and also a super rugby replica jersey of your choice. So head over to the Two Degrees Facebook page and uh, share your favourite game-changing moment of Super Rugby Aotearoa. It may well be Richie Moanga, and you could win. Also on our notice board, um, a couple of weeks ago, we were celebrating a well-being round, and we saw some cool handshakes, didn't we, Mills? I might make you do it again, but you peaked, my friend. Um, and you can support this Head First charity and Tauranga Boys High School uh, by buying a ticket for their Blue Lunch. Guest speaker, da -da -da -da, Sam Kane. So he will be amazing to listen to now the season is all over. You can get all the details from Tauranga Boys, a great cause. No, great to be a part of. I want to put up a shout out as well, Bernie, for the uh, Highlanders alumni. They did manage to get together down in Dunedin. Of course, they weren't able to go to the game, but what they were able to do is to get to create a private function. They followed all of the, um, uh, the COVID rules. Uh, they were certainly uh, isolated themselves. They used the COVID tracing, but I tell you what, it was about, looked as though there was about 50 or 60 of them. And no trouble off the field, lads. No dramas whatsoever. That's what happens when you put them and lock them in a room, right? That's a lot of swan drives, I heard. Well, plenty of swan drives. I tell you what, they would have had a great day out watching the lads get the job done in Dunedin. But look, I tell you, it's been tough once again. Uh, it's great to have you all with us. You're all smiling. It's only week one, though, you know. And, and the news we got last week as we come to the end of the show, it was it was all of a sudden we took a collective breath. But it's been great to be back in everyone's living room from home. And uh, hopefully it's not too long before we're back in the studio. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in seven days. See you, thanks.